Thanks a lot, everyone. Nice to see you here, and especially beautiful to have this celebration seminar for Terry, uh, an amazing man and uh, a pathbreaker, I would say, and uh, and incredibly humble. That's beautiful. So a few things uh, from my end, uh, uh, more or, or some recent things that are going on in, in this uh, complex planet we're living on right now. And many of you are aware of this, uh, this new situation that uh, humanity is in, 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 in not just being globalized, but actually, actually shaping the planet and, and being connected in new ways. There are actually many studies now that show that humans are the ma major driving force in, in evolution on, on Earth. And, and this is a paper that's just coming out now in, in, in annual review of ecology, evolution and systematics, trying to illustrate um, where humans have direct, sort of direct effects on evolution all over the place, basically. Uh, and I think that's an important point, because we often take humans more as a consequence of evolution, but our, we are actually shaping, shaping the planet now uh, at, at even global scales. Some people argue it's the second time that has happened in the history of the planet. The first was when the bacteria started to generate oxygen. So, so, it's, a, so it's, a, it's an interesting phase for us uh, right here to, to be part of that. Uh, another, another piece, actually, that's going to be published uh, at 7 o'clock today, in, in Nature, actually, <laughs> uh, and part of their 150-year jubilee, uh, is, is about trying to understand how we have grown up to become this uh, uh, force. And basically, to make it a long story short there, it really illustrates the incredible sort of sub-efficiency or super-efficiency, you could call it, of, of us in, in, in controlling the planet. Uh, I look at it as having had really strong attractors through trade and globalization to become hyper-efficient in producing th certain things on Earth, actually. Uh, and in, in, uh, and uh, uh, in, in a very big way. But at the same time, reducing the, the flexibility of the planet to deal with changing circumstances. So that's another feature of, of the Anthropocene. Other features are uh, a recent paper up a month ago where we, where we looked at the, uh, the dominance in different sectors of companies who are shaping uh, big biomes like forests, uh, agriculture, and the oceans, actually. And, and if you look, you can't, you can't see it so well, but it really just illustrates that there is a handful of, of companies that are in charge of of, uh, of shaping the planet. And also, when, you ca when it comes to CO2 emissions in relation to income, you can also probably see in that Oxfam picture before. So that's another feature of the Anthropocene. The third one is the whole inequality dimension, of course, which is heavily debated now, and um, with, with a really nice piece on inequality and the biosphere of some people who sits in the room right now. So these are a few features of the Anthropocene. And, and uh, many of us are thinking about what, what is happening in this phase. And, and, and some people are really believe that we are, are in a new space, in a completely new space that can take many new directions. Uh, I did a little piece with Steve Carpenter, Francis Wesley, and Martin Schaeffer, which we called Dance, Dancing on the Volcano. And it's a quote here from a song by the Genesis uh, that uh, some, uh, I guess, at least the older people here in, the, in this room knew, knew that group, but uh, you may have heard of Phil Collins, who was the drummer there. But it goes, the music's playing, the notes are right, put your left foot first and move into the light. The edge of, of this hill is the edge of the world, and if you're going to cross, you better start doing it right, better start doing it right. You better start doing it right, let the dance begin. So I, thi I think to many of us it's it's really where we are now as a, as a species on Earth. Uh, it's a balancing act, and, and the trick is really to, to try to balance it in, in a favorable way for us as humans on Earth. And, and to me, that's where stewardship really comes in, actually. Stewardship is really essential in, in, in this crucial time for, for humanity. And, and really try to reconnect development in a just and sustainable manner to the foundation of the earth that we're living on, actually. Uh, that's, to me, this the core of, of stewardship. And it involves uh, all the issues that Maria, Maria raised with caring 
and, and agency and, and uh, knowledge systems and, and what Terry talked about also and Per talked about the capacities. Uh, per and Terry showed versions of this one uh, and just to highlight that the, the figure that Per showed is really based on uh, inductive empirical work, you could say, trying to understand how how real-world systems have shifted from uncoordinated or new management to ecosystem stewardship. And uh, if you want to read more about that, there are some references there to, to look into. But we found that it, it, it often follows, not follows, but has these ingredients in, in them, these type of transitions. And one is from the Great Barrier Reef, another one from coastal fisheries in Chile, and the third from uh, southern Sweden, Kristianstad Vattenrike. Uh, what's interesting also is that it's not only local. Here is another example from work that Henrik Esterblom has done, many, many uh, publications on, on uh, the southern oceans and the illegal fishing there. And if you follow from the left there, A to B, you can see what happened there was that a few individuals actually in Norway got really upset when they found out that their fishing fleets were down in the southern ocean fishing and, and started to create networks of mobilization and, and succeeded in, in starting to curb illegal fishing if you go to the 1988-99 uh, and created a sort of a fairly dynamic network between in, uh, some industries uh, and use and, and uh, succeeded in changing flag states to take on illegal fish. Uh, but then it collapsed and, and the illegal fishing increased again but it got mobilized once more and, and uh, fi finally it became connected to the Camelor Convention. So, and it operates as a global, global adaptive governance structure that curb illegal fishing. So, so I'm giving this case as an illustration of this emergence of, of uh, capacities that then can lead to a global outcome actually. That that's, at least has worked so far. Another one that we've been working with is, is uh, what we call keystone actors. We, we did a study that found that there were 13 companies who basically shaped the oceans through their fishing. Um, about 15-16% um, about of everything that we eat from the oceans are going through these companies. And now we work with 10 of them at CEO level to, to, to shift them from exploiters to stewards of the oceans. And that initiative is now in, in its fourth year. And it has started to create rings on the water outside it, the initiative also on, on uh, this type of process that Per mentioned of, of, of bigger, bigger actors or, or nations doing, doing things together. We looked at ocean stewardship as an adaptive and learning-based collaborative process of responsibility and ethics aimed to shepherd and safeguard the resilience and sustainability of ocean ecosystems for human well-being. What has happened here so far which I think is interesting is that, is that in the, when we started it up, it was largely an issue of, of trying to comply uh, with, with the challenges uh, and it's now moving to deep conviction that this is the way to go. Uh, it was from adjusting to developing strategies for sustainable futures. It was moving from individual species to really looking at stewardship of the oceans to be able to harvest those species and just from a sector to uh, a major collaborator with the biosphere, and I think that's the process that uh, we're in right now in, in, with, with these companies. Uh, so if I su sum up uh, those case studies we have had, we've, we found uh, that there are some key features uh, common to all of them as part of this uh, transformation towards um, biosphere or ecosystem or seascape stewardship. Often a crisis, that make people rethink and, and often develop a new way of thinking about things, a new vision, uh, thereby reframing the, the relation between people and planet. Often there are agency or key actors, sometimes called polity entrepreneurs, actor groups, that start to mobilize and combine networks. And out of that, a breaching organization tend to emerge that, that connects uh, levels and scales, actually. And that is happening within existing institutions, norms and rules, or, or enabling legislation. But also new institutions may emerge out of that. And it's, it, it's, it's a move from silo management to more broader landscape and seascape approach, actually. And it's, it is, it's a process. It is experimental and it's learning-based. 
and, and it tried to anticipate. I think that's an in interesting point, because uh, here's another paper that's uh, very soon uh, going to be published also, that uh, is led by Caroline Schill, who will be in the panel. And, and uh, it's really about increasing, uh, extending the way we think about uh, human actions uh, in our models and approaches, actually, from the more very simplistic homo economicus to the quasi-rational, which is often done in, in, in several areas, like in, in behavioral economics. But but really extending it into what we plea for now, and culturated and, and earthened, to be, to be really emphasizing the broader cultural context and, and being part of the planet. And we look at that as a, as a, as a complex adaptive systems approach, actually, where, where the interactions between the individuals or the agents lead to, to patterns at higher scales that then feed back to the agents. And, and, uh, uh, that's the dynamic process, and that's what I described a little bit for, for the Southern Ocean, that type of dynamics, actually. And, and we believe that that type of dynamic is going on all the time among people and groups, actually, and, and, and should be better understood and acted upon. Uh, it it, it uh, gets to this whole idea of, 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 of looking at the world in this dy dynamic phase, actually. How can, we, how can we secure favorable outcomes under new circumstances and, when necessary, by new means? even when that entails significant modifications to behavior or to the social framework that structure and give meaning to behavior. And that's a, that's a comment from Michel Lamont and Hall's work on social resilience in the liberal area, a really nice book if you haven't seen it. And it relates also to what Per talked about, of, of transforming in, in a deeper sense, actually. And there's a lot of work now on, on looking at new basically new uh, narratives, I, I, would, I, I call it new attractors, that sort of stimulate development on certain pathways. Uh, we have had very strong attractors after the Second World War or of, or for stimulating uh, the very rapid speed into a globalized world, but we need new ones for sustainability now. And there are different concepts for that. Some people are talking about imagined orders, Basically, that uh, stories that are shared by a certain amount of people then lead to, to uh, belief systems of, of that's the way the world works. And, and some people call that imagined orders, or collective imaginaries, or cultural repertoires, and, and, or framed creativity. And I think that uh, this whole stewardship thing is, 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 could represent such a new narrative, actually, that is very important in that context. Because, because right now, it's, bit, it's a bit confused, uh, and, uh, and uh, we are sort of still debating what is right or wrong. We are in a situation of, of, um, of not being conscious of, of what's happening through our actions on Earth, actually. But luckily, we have this guy, and, 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 he, and, <laughs> and, and he, 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 he's, he's leading the way, and we're very happy about that. Thank you very much. <laughs>